Well, let's start. Uh, I just want to say thanks to the organizers for inviting me as a moderator for this session and to putting together this important event and facilitating a global interchange of ideas in the field of urban studies. Well, welcome everyone to this, uh, to the session of night governance. I think uh, governance uh, is a central topic in night studies, both for academic research and policy and practice. Uh, governance is a theme that crosses different research areas on night studies in one way or another. And uh, every research, in my opinion, has to deal with formal and informal ways of regulation of the night. And I also think that it's a complex subject. Uh, since governance is never complete or finished, it has a dynamic nature and faces constant restructuring due to internal and external shocks as uh, these times with the pandemic. So I think we need re regular monitoring and of individual cases and continuous production of comparative studies among cities and nations. Uh, I think we're going to start with uh, Jess Reya. She's from the University of Virginia, and she's presenting open data policies for nightlife governance. Jess, the screen is yours. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, I cannot track the time, so please, Alejandro, let me know uh, if I'm running out of time, if you would be so kind. Thank you. So. Uh, I brought today, uh, this is a work in progress. Some of you already uh, saw me talking about this uh, before. It's advancing uh, slowly as things change. So I started this research uh, in Montreal where I was both a researcher and also like working in advocacy with the NICH Council in Montreal that was created last year. And I will talk a little bit about this. So during my research and this kind of like police work, we found out that uh, there was like this lack of open data for the night. Some of these data sets are there, are available, uh, sometimes just for the government, you not for the general public. And sometimes they just like scatter all over the place. And as the pandemic started, we, we're trying to gather all the information we could to help us understand the impacts of the pandemic on nightlife and all the stakeholders um, inhabiting the night. And that was quite difficult. And then we realized that, that there's not much information available. And so this project, this project was a, shaped a little bit by this context. I'm looking specifically at Montreal uh, it started in Montreal and now that I'm kind of like trying to understand this uh, in the Americas, mostly North America at the moment. But um, and as a background, I've been working with uh, science and technology studies for a while. And uh, here you can see a little bit where I come from, this quite interdisciplinary background. So there's a lot of public policy and law and critical data studies. And also all the years I spent doing advocacy with civil society in Latin America. And so it's kind of like it's such an interdisciplinary background and the theoretical framework reflects that. Uh, so I worked in Latin America for a few years with smart cities initiatives, deployment of technology in urban spaces, and also like power relations um, in uh, urban spaces. And then this research specifically started at McGill University. I was a Mellon Fellow there and later also a BMO Fellow at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Montreal. And then I started to develop this project called Data Governance for the 24-Hour City. Uh, and now I move at this project here with me to the University of Virginia, where I'm based in the School of Data Science. So it makes a lot of sense and things are changing a little bit on how I'm looking into this because I'm not a data practitioner myself. I'm not a data science. I look to data science from the social science perspective. And now I can finally have like more technical support to develop this uh, research. There's monster for those who not know in Quebec, Canada, an island known for its like vibrant nightlife, and more recently as a hub for artificial intelligence initiatives, smart cities. So these discussions are connected. These two agendas are there happening at the same times, so often not super connected, even though they are um, in reality kind of addressing similar issues in different ways. 
Uh, so Montreal received like a $50 million award from Infrastructure Canada as a smart city in 2019. They are consolidating the social data hub. There's not much info available at the moment. And uh, recently they also started to design this uh, digital data charter, which is a good step. It's a first step, but as you can imagine, if nightlife is impacted by this kind of policy framework and regulation, uh, re regulatory framework, but it's not addressed there at all. So my reflection is more about like how is night life impacted uh, by these documents and can we maybe make these two agendas talk to each other uh, and address the same issues. So the pandemic was impacted Montreal badly. Uh, we were under curfew for almost five months and we had like lots of restrictions that just now are being lifted. Um, in the city and here, as I'm sure Nandor and Andreina, if they're here, they will talk about this uh, chapter that we, it was released in March this year about nighttime governance in the times of COVID-19. And Will and I and Mathieu contributed to uh, the Montreal section of it. And we briefly addressed this lack of data and open data that makes it really difficult to really grasp the impacts of the pandemic in the city. And some of you saw this, I've been working with this for a, this kind of ecosystem for a while. And now hopefully I'll have data visualization colleagues to help me to make this look better because it's so small and it's so difficult to show this in presentations. And, um, and hopefully we will improve this ecosystem. The, it, but the main idea here is just to show like how complex natural life is and you have like all the stakeholders and most of them deal with data sets or need data to work like the entertainment the industry to calculate the loss or the impacts that the pandemic had and even like looking beyond the pandemic to like create this kind of sustainable open data policy so we can have means to understand nightlife in a responsible way and i'll get to that in a minute so we had the night council established from Montreal Vancouver Vancouver last year, which I'm part, I'm a member, my main date ends in May next year. And I've been dealing mostly with this issues of data governance uh, and the deployment of technologies in some way, but mostly this data governance and protection framework and open data policies in the city, trying to help as much as possible from this kind of like academic perspective. And uh, both Will and I were involved in the nightlife policy and many other people in the city in these working groups. We had uh, reports and public consultations and this topic of data, even if marginal within the, the greater framework of nightlife, it's there. And many partners and stakeholders could benefit from better open data policies and data inventories because so far, the data inventory we had was like a one page PDF document, and we could not even have access to all the data sets in there. This is the report we wrote last year. Um, a little bit of the, the nightlife policy, how it's being designed, and this idea of like reinforce, uh, recognize, promote, and reconciliate the city with the night. It was like this collaborative efforts. We haven't seen the final draft bill and the final like policy yet and we really hope to see this Montreal is going through the elections this year and in December we held the public consultations with citizens so we have like five different groups and it became quite clear to how we need to have like more studies more research more information and uh, open data available about nightlife in the city so we can impact and understand impacts like in specific historically marginalized communities for example and uh, also help small business and other actors in this network to um, keep afloat and uh, keep doing what they do. So we had like a few campaigns as Montreal, Montreal, Vancouver, Vancouver and the Night Council. We had the first night summit last year and now we'll have the second one in October if you are around. It's going to be held in person, I think. Things change quickly. And so uh, for this, and uh, I would love to hear ideas. Uh, we are changing, as I said, a little bit uh, the approach. So there are these regulatory and policy frameworks. I've been trying to map all the open data policies 
possible in Canada in, at the federal, provincial, and municipal level too. I'm looking at data sets, seeing what's available, what's not available, what could be available, um, conducting interviews. And also there is the online survey that was terribly delayed. And I hope to share it soon. Uh, with, we're going to send like this online survey to as many people as possible. We map it, I'll show you with like more than 200 organizations and people and ask then a uh, few questions to understand what aspects uh, of data governance for the night would be useful for them. So we, I want to know like where and how the lack of consistent data affects the work of these actors, how irresponsible data practices would harm their communities. Because when you're talking about nightlife, we're talking about several communities that could be harmed if the data was open and available and if they are made visible and some people do not want or cannot be visible. So I think it's very important to address this idea of like responsible data science and uh, uh, responsible data practices over here. And how, uh, how are the perceptions of data governance policies in Montreal that if while we have like a social data hub and are uh, seen as a smart city, uh, are these things reflected in how people are perceiving these policies? Can they have access to the things that they need? And trying to establish this kind of partnerships for open data with, uh, public sector, industry, um, and even the Urban Innovation Laboratory um, had accepted at the time to kind of see if they could open up a few data sets for everybody. I don't know, but these things require like continuous exhaustive dialogue. Um, and hopefully we can make, and the idea is that this could be potentially replicated in other cities here in North America. And this is something that we hope to do over the um, next year in conversation with both Alejandro and Will and hopefully we can uh, extend this edge of governance and data for uh, in North America. So here are like a few examples of data sets. And if you look for what kind of open data is available in, term, in regards to nightlife, and then you have a few things like uh, business, uh, things happening at night, lots of things about crime and security. And in Montreal specifically, you have lots of data for transportation and mobility, uh, security few things about business and economy, very few things about the cultural sector that could uh, be like, could benefit a lot from like any kind of improvement. And here, uh, it's another really ugly visualization uh, format for things, but here you have like uh, 200 uh, organizations map it in the context and need to be really careful because lots of them are dealing with from the represented communities and we really need to make sure that uh, we're not harming anyone and doing this in a responsible way and opening up data because uh, the idea of like more data, the better uh, is not true. Uh, we need to be like very responsible and accountable in our approach to governance in data over here. Now, luckily being based at the School of Data Science, we like talking about this in, in terms of like having multidisciplinary teams that could help us address this properly. And uh, we're studying with Montreal, but the idea would be, as I said, to look into other cities as well. And I would love like any kind of feedback and ideas as we are redeveloping, reshaping this project would be much appreciated. And I really thank you all of you, Alejandro, and everybody for being here. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I think this is a central topic uh, to understand uh, governance now and in the future. And I think uh, what you mentioned about the different dimensions uh, of uh, open data as the availability, the responsibility of using those data, the possible effects of uh, the, those databases, the different ways of partnership, the different sources. And I think that this is a, a open debate. Uh, and uh, I think it's gonna be very useful for every city, every major city. Uh, in the world. Okay, so now I think uh, Andreina and Nandor are here. I think they couldn't come. Okay, so we're gonna move to the next. Um, sorry? Yeah, I, I, was, I was just late, I'm sorry, because um, oh, Nandor, right. yeah, I was trying to join the section at, uh, at, at uh, 3 p.m., but it, 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 uh, it said that it, was, wasn't started yet. And um, uh, I also want to say that Andreina noticed me that uh, um, she, she wouldn't be able to 
be here. So I will be the only one who will present the material now. Okay, please go ahead, Nando. Yeah, so just sharing my screen. Yes, so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, uh, that I can present the uh, chapter five called Nighttime Governance in Times of COVID uh, of the GNRP, the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan. I am Nandor Petrovic. I'm working as an assistant lecturer and a doctoral researcher at the Corvinus University of Budapest. And you can see this beautiful city behind me. So hopefully, some of you can visit uh, in the in the future, but of course now we have to talk about uh, the sad stories, but also about inspirational stories, uh, uh, how cities were able to cope with the with the pandemic. So first of all, a few words about the GNRP. I think many of you already know what was this project. Um, the Global Nighttime Recovery Plan is a collaborative practical guide that aims to provide. Um, all members of the nighttime ecosystem, the knowledge and the tools uh, and the, uh, for the cities uh, that they can plan uh, safe uh, and, and equitable reopening. It is providing practices, so workable approaches. It is trying to give examples of uh, innovative solutions. And it, it, it is also acknowledging that uh, what was working in one particular cultural context may not work in other contexts. So it's a uh, it is also an important question. Uh, and we are also suggesting that uh, the data are essential. So presentation, uh, presentation from Jess was, was very crucial, I think, uh, also from this perspective. Uh, there were several chapters of the GNRP. Uh, one was dealing with open air nightlife. One was dealing with uh, indoor spaces, also with venues and uh, city infrastructure, also with financial support. And there will be the last uh, uh, chapter uh, coming out in the, uh, um, in a few weeks, I guess, which will be exactly about the data and measurement. But now I will talk about the chapter five, which was about the nighttime governance. Um, I have to say a huge thanks for the for the GNRP editors and the coordinating team, and also uh, to my colleague Andreina, uh, who was uh, who was the chapter uh, the co lead uh, 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 for this chapter, and also for the contributors and the interviewees. Uh, so the aim of the chapter uh, was to, to provide uh, uh, some examples, some good examples, uh, how nighttime governance institutions were responding to the COVID-19 crisis and how were uh, they able to, uh, uh, to build local capacity to sustain and recover uh, uh, nighttime ecosystems. Of course, we all know that the, the, the night, night schemes and nighttime economies have been affected by restrictive measures. Uh, it, uh, it, it created a, a pressure on nighttime governance institutions uh, like nightmares and other institutions, but it also raised awareness uh, of the high demand for leisure and culture, which I think is a very important point. And a lot of people uh, became aware uh, of the importance of the, of the nighttime uh, uh, during the pandemic. Um, but but we, we experienced that, uh, that the cities were and, and nighttime governance institutions were able to develop new and innovative ways of cooperation. Uh, they were able to, uh, to manage uh, uh, the crisis to some extent. And in this chapter, we were aiming to provide some practical insights from the perspective of advocacy organizations and also from policymakers. So it's a practice oriented material. It is less scientific, but I think it's also important to, 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 to provide knowledge and provide uh, uh, examples for the, for the, for the practitioners. Uh, I will present case studies from Montreal, also, uh, also from Helsinki, Tokyo, Wilnius, and Melbourne to illustrate how cities around the world created different types of institutions and how uh, they implemented the strategies for building local capacity uh, to manage the nighttime economies. Uh, uh, in, in the material, we, we've, we've been starting from the, from the uh, um, situation of, of nighttime governance. Night has been a, historically been a, a, a highly regulated space, uh, but the concept of, of, uh, of nighttime governance is relatively new. Uh, it, 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 it based on the, on the idea that the night has to be managed in a strategic way in order to accommodate uh, the needs and interests uh, of, of all the players on the 
uh, in, in the NITM ecosystems. And here we provide uh, uh, a small uh, figure of the possible uh, actors in the NITM ecosystems, both uh, from the, from the uh, uh, public side and, and also from the, from the private uh, uh, sector. Uh, in the chapter, we were also addressing the question who, who are managing the city at night. Uh, and we, we, we had uh, we had the typology for uh, for governance institutions, and uh, we were trying to stress that uh, the basically uh, uh, the, the most important uh, function of these institutions is to connect uh, actors and uh, and uh, 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 foster collaboration. Uh, the, the central actor, uh, in, in our view, uh, in these ecosystems, uh, the central act, central actor. Are the night mayors or the other uh, nighttime governance institutions? Uh, they are basically, uh, in, in our view, basically they are they are doing three uh, things. Uh, they are dealing with the with the hardware part of the of the uh, of the nighttime governance. Also, uh, uh, it's meaning the, the the infrastructure of the cities. Uh, the lighting, the basic services, and so on. Also, they are dealing with the with the soft software, so the soft side, uh, like the regulations and and and, and other uh, um, and, and and like like licensing and other other laws. But the but the most important function is is mediating and promoting consensus uh, among actors uh, and trying to build alliances and networks uh, between uh, private and public actors. And we will see good examples of these efforts. Uh, in the in this chapter and in this material, um, we were also uh, trying to provide a, a very simple typology for for these uh, uh, nighttime governance institutions, uh, giving the examples for independent advocates and nightmares, and also uh, giving giving examples for for those organizations uh, who are uh, supported or funded by local governments. Um, so, about the case studies, the um, the first case study is about Montreal. Uh, it, it was a very inspirational case study for, for us. It, I think it was the first case study which, uh, what, we were, what we were doing. Um, in, in 2017, Montreal, uh, the nighttime uh, actors in Montreal began organizing a, a, a group, uh, the MTL 2424, which was representing participants uh, uh, in the nighttime cultural sector. It was a civic organization. Um, and also what we, we've seen that, that this whole network was expanded because in, in 2020, uh, uh, the MTR 2424 launched uh, this, uh, this night council, uh, which is an independent body bringing together 12 representatives from different sectors. And they were work, working in, in committees like uh, dealing with health, security, diversity, and inclusion, lifestyle clubs, cultural bars and venues, and also festivals and events. Um, on the other side, uh, the Montreal city government began to elaborate a new and, and a more comprehensive nightlife policy. And they also uh, named uh, a commissioner for, uh, of, of noise and night uh, in 2020. So both the, both the civil side uh, and the private uh, side and also the, the, the public side of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the nighttime government started to, uh, started to, to, to be organized. Um, in 2020, a steering committee was established uh, where various uh, stakeholders were invited to contribute in four, four working groups. So, but we can see that also they were trying to specialize on, on different issues. Um, also in 2020, they, they initiated a public consultation in order to understand the perceptions and the needs of Montreal residents concerning a, a new uh, nighttime policy. Um, I think uh, Jess uh, uh, already, uh, 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 had a few words about it. It, it, it. it was very, very interesting and very inspirational um, case for us. Uh, what, what we can see here that the, the COVID-19 pandemic pushed the city to consult with the, with the, uh, uh, with this, with the civil organization, this MTR 2424 and, and other stakeholders. And uh, they, they began to develop uh, some instruments uh, like public offices, councils, public consultations, data inventory, uh, and they were also trying to focusing on the medium uh, uh, and, and long-term uh, uh, nighttime uh, policy strategy. Um, and, and also 
uh, we highlighted this participatory policy making process, which was very important. Uh, the second case study was Helsinki, um, where uh, they, they were uh, they were already uh, 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 pointed out that uh, that the that the, the, there is a there is a need for for uh, uh, strengthening the the connection uh, between the the city's uh, nighttime ecosystem uh, uh, with the with the with the local government and. Uh, in, in, in Helsinki, they uh, uh, they uh, appointed a night liaison uh, in uh, in March 2020 uh, um, with the aim of uh, of developing the city's nightlife, and it was very interesting for us because uh, uh, when we were making the interview with Sala, uh, who who is in this position, uh, she pointed out that uh, it was it was also not very clear for her uh, uh, what, what could be the role of this uh, of this new uh, of this new institution. But uh, um, also, uh, they, they were able to uh, to draw attention uh, and 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 put uh, put uh, uh, the night the, the issues of nighttime in the in, in the focus of the government's attention. Um, also, they were able to uh, to make some public spaces more accessible for uh, for 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 use of uh, for using uh, for citizens and uh, and the and the cultural uh, activities. Um, also, they pointed out that the that the that the, that there is a challenge uh, uh, because there, there was no reliable data uh, on the on the nighttime economy of uh, of Helsinki. So, so I can also uh, um, I can also say that the that the data is is, is crucial from from this regard. Um, the the four, uh, the third case study was Tokyo. Um, Tokyo was in a relative uh, good situation from from the perspective of uh, of nighttime governance, because uh, not just in Tokyo but also in Japan there is the Japan Nighttime Economy Association, um, which which has been a prominent actor uh, in establishing uh, negotiations with government uh, officials. Um, this is a non-profit organization founded in 2019. Um, they were trying to build a network of creative and nightlife business operators, and they were already lobbying uh, the government for better regulations, and they were they were also able to 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 make plans and implement uh, uh, different projects. Uh, Forty four different projects were implemented in the last few years by uh, by the GNEA. Um, also, they 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 published the creative footprint uh, for Tokyo in collaboration with Vibe Lab, uh, and summarizing their activities. Is we, we just found that they were able to build cooperative partnerships with governmental organizations, with, which, which turned to be crucial uh, in the times of pandemic. Because uh, after the outbreak of the pandemic, the GNA started to lobby at different uh, public stakeholders, including the national government and also the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Um, in collaboration with several other teams, they submitted a set of proposals uh, to support music, uh, uh, entertainment, food service, and tourism sectors. Uh, these uh, proposals uh, uh, include emergency loans, uh, subsidy uh, for, for venues, uh, and also an increase in compensation for, uh, for workers uh, 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 lost income, and also uh, uh, simplifications in administrative procedures. Um, but what we've seen that the, that the government actually incorporated and implemented several uh, uh, elements of, of, of their proposals. And, and we just found that, uh, that the GNEA is playing a double role uh, 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 in directions because uh, uh, they are acting as an interface between the private and public sectors um, and between the different industry sectors, including music, entertainment, tourism, food service, like I said. Uh, and also the GNEA is acting as a policy advisor for political decision makers, like ministries and government committees. Uh, and it is really able to to grasp the reality uh, of the of of the nighttime economic players and develop uh, uh, and the, and they were able to develop a concrete set of proposals. So 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 translating uh, uh, the needs for the for the government. The fourth case study was Vilnius. Uh, we we have we've been able to see a uh, uh, kind of different approach because in in Tokyo they were building capacity on in above, but in Vilnius they were rebuilding capacity. Another two minutes, please. Okay, yes, they they, they were able to to uh, to build capacities on the grassroots levels. Um, the the cre creativity and and the innovation was was a crucial uh, issue in in, in Vilnius 
they've been they've been using digital uh, uh, technologies uh, to, to to provide uh, forums for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, creative artists and other and and, and other players uh, to, uh, to to uh, to 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 promote their ideas. Um, what we've seen in real news that creative approach and tangible ideas can attract people and uh, and and the and the uh, uh, cooperation could rely on trust and and also on grassroots organizations. And it is it is uh, uh, possible to encourage small and sometimes incremental changes. The, the last case study was Melbourne. Um, and just one one uh, uh, sentence about Ma Melbourne. In, in Melbourne, we've seen that that the that the academia uh, can 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 provide ideas for government, and they, and they, they will be able to use uh, um, to use nighttime governance as, as an experimental space. So, in sum, uh, 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 this is my last slide for this. Presentation. We've seen uh, some examples how nighttime governance has adapted uh, or evolved during the crisis. Institutions and organizations for nighttime governance were able to establish to be established, like in Helsinki. They were able to expand their networks, like in Montreal. They were able to cooperate and transfer knowledge, like in in uh, uh, Melbourne. They were also able to gain and exploit capacities on the top levels, like in Tokyo. And they were also uh, uh, able to build capacities on the grassroots level, like in Vilnius. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nandur. I think it's very interesting, your presentation, and it opens an, a different way of seeing the pandemics. It's looking at the governance during this crisis period as a, a time of learning and finding a new, different ways, needs, and spaces of, of intervention. I think it's very important. So now, Michaela, uh, it's your turn. Uh, Hello, it is not letting me share my screen, unfortunately. Uh, Manuel, are you there? Can you help us with this? Co host, you should do it. So just let me check. Ooh, here. Okay, wait a second. It has done now. Let me have a look. It might have been the system preferences on my uh, device. There you go. Can you see that now? Is yeah, that we, can. we can see that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry about that teething, teething problems when I've not been on this laptop for a little while. Um, so hello, I just want to quickly introduce my project and myself and then come on to uh, my findings. So the title today is you have to think I've seen these people before policing urban nights and the reproduction of white local and cultural modes of acceptability at night. So um, today my presentation is based upon uh, my PhD research. So I finished my PhD in April of this year. I had my viva um, under the great supervision of Dr. Adam Eldridge, who I think is out there right now watching me. Um, so just a shout out to Adam and say thank you to him. Um, my PhD uh, was a year long ethnography, which I conducted in 2018. Uh, alongside bouncers, venue managers, police officers, licensing officers and street pastors in an area in the UK that I have called Greenshire. And I will come on to introduce a little bit more about what Greenshire is like in, in a minute. I also conducted 36 semi-structured interviews with my nighttime participants as well collated extensive field notes, conducted extensive field notes and observations of the door and dance floor at urban nights. So when I'm using the term urban nights in my presentation, I'm using a term that was frequently used by my research participants to refer to nighttime events where black uh, genres of music were played, including hip hop and R&B, but more particularly and more recently within a UK context, drill and grime. So very briefly, UK drill music is an adaptation of Chicago drill music, which sprang in the mid noughties. Uh, drill music videos have been used in evidence in court proceedings by the police um, for those who face criminalization. Um, and grime has also um, been very kind of present in discourses around um, criminalizing young black men from uh, London council states in the UK. So grime came first and then and then drill was born. 
Um, and this presentation draws primarily from observations of bouncers uh, on the door and the dance floor at Urban Nights and also observations and interviews with venue managers. And what I really want to get across in this presentation is uh, the paradoxical situation of black youth as both wanted and unwanted in the nighttime economy in which I conducted my ethnography. So this gives you a little flavour of uh, where I conducted my ethnography. It's a wealthy county in the south of England, very nearby to London. Uh, the area is made up of a number of market towns, some boasting um, private schools, acres of rural countryside, okay. and others more densely populated. Importantly here, um, it's important to point out that 90% of residents describe themselves as white British in the last census. Now, most venues uh, are owned by large corporate chains and offer very mainstream, predominantly, um, mainstream experiences catering for predominantly white, local and largely heterosexual clientele. However, over the last decade, there's been a marked increase in the number of black students studying at a new university campus in Greenshire. And this coupled with the popularity of drill and mu um, grime music, which is now becoming coming into the mainstream and being commercialized within a UK context at least, has meant that some venue managers have begun to host these urban nights. Uh, the clientele at urban nights was markedly different to other nighttime uh, events that I observed. This was made up predominantly of black African and black Caribbean youth whilst some other white locals and white students attended. Black individuals also traveled predominantly from London to attend urban nights where uh, grime and drill artists were presenting, were hosting that night. So throughout the field work, uh, venue managers described nightlife in Greenshire as diverse and multicultural. These were their kind of words that they used. And they referred to the increased popularity of music associated with black culture to evidence that nightlife in Greenshire caters to a range of different ethnic and racial audiences. So Michael was a marketing manager at a nightclub I've called Altitude, and he says the music we play now is commercialized, radios are playing it more frequently, and at festivals you see more urban people, hip hop people, they're headlining now and lots of people are here for it. And Jason was a venue manager that um, I spoke to a lot throughout the ethnography and conducted a lot of observations at this nightclub. Uh, said there are nightclubs now, the big commercial ones, 2000 people plus, they have an urban room. They have that urban room because it's becoming so popular. People love our urban night. We get all colors and creeds coming. So Jason spoke quite positively in his interview about the change that he'd seen since he was a venue manager, um, having 30 years experience in the southeast of the UK. Um, in recent years, Jason had even uh, worked with police licensing officers to organise a bus to transport students from the university to the nightclub specifically for urban nights. So for venue managers, hosting these urban nights allowed them to accrue income uh, on nights when the nightclub would otherwise be closed. And there was support for these nights um, from venue managers. Despite venue managers hosting and supporting these nights though, there was a common understanding um, amongst venue managers that they needed to be closely policed and hyper governed. And this is what I mean by that paradoxical situation between black youth being wanted on the one hand, we're going to construct these urban nights for you, but on the other hand, we need to closely monitor and police you. And I'm now gonna kind of use this section of the presentation to show how black youth faced hypervigilant policing practices um, on urban nights. So prior to urban nights commencing, an enhanced door team was called upon by venue managers to work the door and the dance floor. Many more door staff, both on the door and inside the nightclub. Venue managers operated an all search policy on urban nights where all nighttime revelers were searched on the door. This differed to weekend nights. Particular attention was given to items hidden under 
all within headwear, bags and pockets. And part of this was because of an assumed, well, presumed interracial clash between black youth and white locals. So Rebecca in her interview said, here it's very much, we slice our bread this way, we walk this way and we dance this way. The locals are not any, open to anything new. Say it's an urban night, the students are about and their music comes on. The locals, we leave the dance floor and be like, well, what is this? It's the type of place where everyone stops and looks and goes, who is that and who are they? It's very, very insular indeed. So I argue that this use of we, the repeated use of we here, uh, by Rebecca is indicative of a racialized norm, which predicates itself upon particular particular white, often local norms of behaviour and embodiment at night. And black nighttime participants who spoke, danced and moved, walked in certain different ways, appeared visible to both locals, but also those responsible for governing uh, the nighttime venue. So this resulted in the segregation of urban nights. Um, and what venue managers did was they used weeknights to host an urban night rather than allowing these to be hosted on the weekend. So Jason uh, said, if we had a student night on a Tuesday, it's all 18, 19 year olds from the university and we might get four black guys, they'll get knocked back. The reason is because we don't want the different, you know, the clash. We turn around and say, lads, you want to come to the urban night tomorrow? What are you doing? It's the wrong night tonight. So venue managers were attentive to a clash uh, between locals and black men, but also uh, army lads as well, which um, Jason mentioned in his interview. These army lads and young black men were seen as a risk to the ambience of the venues, but also the whites inside the venue. So during observations, it was noted that venue managers supported informal door policies where nighttime consumers were more likely to be declined for being black, having Northern accents, appearing to be laborers and being in the army. So lots going on here with connections between race and class and also masculinities. So these nighttime participants were problematized for not knowing kind of how nightlife operates in Greenshire. And I draw specifically uh, upon Calwon Bhopal's work around acceptable and unacceptable whiteness to show how acceptable whiteness was privileged in the space of green shit at night. So you were given access, more likely to be given access, if you had a Southern accent, you dressed smartly and you appeared non-threatening in both your physique and your body language. So the next part of this presentation looks specifically at door staff as the main keepers on, of the venue. And I argue that door staff are kind of caught in a double bind, whereby venue managers are beginning to host urban nights now, whilst they are entrusted to manage the presumed heightened risk that presents itself uh, on these nights. And this can dis disorientated um, venue managers um, and they worked to kind of use the door and the dance floor as a place to kind of reinform uh, white local and cultural modes of being, being very attentive to the body language, speech patterns and word choice of black nighttime participants. So Kenny was a member of door, uh, door team that I observed at a number of urban nights. And in uh, his interview, this is from, he spoke about uh, black men specifically. And he said, they're much more street, much more gangster than a Saturday night. If they turn up being rude to me, I'll be rude back. At the end of the day, respect works both ways. So if you can't turn up somewhere and all you've got to say is evening, or if you turn up and at this point, Kenny walked with his arms out wide to the side of his body and leant in the opposite direction in a bowling fashion, stated in a low voice, I want to come in. If you have that attitude at the front door, then what's that attitude going to be when someone bumps you into you in the nightclub? So door staff throughout the ethnography repeatedly uh, mentioned uh, you, black individuals using uh, different body language and also different sayings or words that they didn't understand. 
they took this uh, to be an indication that these young black individuals, often young black men, had an attitude. And so I argue when forms of embodiment differ from that white local normative benchmark, they were attached to a pre-existing stereotype, often of black male gang membership, shown here when uh, Kenny says this might be a gangster thing. So another thing that came up was the need to make efficient decisions uh, at the door. And these efficient decisions led to uh, social categorizations. So Toby and, uh, was the head doorman at Altitude, and he said, you have to make a judgment on that front door. And I always say you have three seconds to make it. You look at someone and you have three seconds before you say something, whether that's you're coming in or not, you have to make that judgment call. You're there to perform a really brief risk assessment. So Thomas Ogard has already written in his work around uh, how door staff tested black nighttime participants uh, for their attitude. And I found very much the same in my research with uh, bouncers making that brief risk assessment on the door. From observations in Greenshear, at least, this was increased questioning of black nighttime participants. What are you doing here? Where you come from? Where are you going tonight? Increased searching, increased assessment of their body language before they uh, even kind of entered the nightclub queue, and assessment of their dress, where could they be hiding weapons, where could they be hiding knives, guns, etc. In cases where black nighttime participants spoke in more local accents, they queued outside the nightclub and they dressed uh, more smartly with their trousers up, uh, wearing smart shoes and no headwear also having short cropped hairstyles, these black men were treated with much less suspicion. Now I'm really conscious of the time, but another thing I wanted to just speak about was the dance floor. The dance floor, a lot of the work on door work has focused specifically on the door. And some work has started to speak about governance of black individuals once inside nighttime venues. So that idea that black individuals here were wanted, we wanted them, um, kind of at urban nights, but we didn't want them acting or being too black. And one of the ways in which that this was kind of governed inside the nightclub was uh, through the dance styles. So a lot of dance styles like popping, locking, breaking, um, things associated with UK drill music, drill music were uh, governed by door staff who would tell uh, black consumers to calm down stop dancing like that, calm down. They would walk through groups um, of black people dancing in an attempt to disperse them. And even in some incidents, when being told to calm down and black nighttime participants responded saying they were doing nothing wrong, door staff uh, ended up kind of inciting the behavior that they were initially looking at, uh, looking for, and then throwing those um, usually black men outside of the nightclub. So I argued that black individuals race coupled with their dance style made them visible to door staff um, who walked through them in an attempt to disperse them. Now this is just my last slide and I just wanted to raise some really important points that have come from um, this chapter which started as a chapter in my PhD. So there's a stark contradiction present in the increased commercialization of drill and grime and the number of nightclubs playing this music set against the ways in which black nighttime consumers are governed themselves. So it's, we are gonna host this urban night, we want you here, but we don't want you acting and being too black. Very much a, a lot of tensions and contradictions there and black nighttime consumers facing exclusionary, hypervigilant and discriminatory policing practices. This enhanced by the white provincial space in which my ethnography was based. Importantly, raising some really important points around the hierarchies of whiteness and how not all whites were afforded accent, uh, access and working class hyper-masculine whites were kept out at the door. Whilst previous research has explored how ethnic minorities are policed on the door, this shows how their governance continues it once inside the nighttime venue, it transcends the door. 
And finally, and I think most importantly for me, this work questions the relatively ungoverned nature of private nighttime actors who are you know, not called to account for these discriminatory and exclusionary policing practices that they up, uh, uphold in the nighttime economy. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. I welcome any questions.